Good morning, everybody. It's good to see you this morning. Our call to worship is hymn number two, Holy, Holy, Holy. but she came back <laughs> earlier than what she was anticipating. And so I thank the Lord for that. Don't you, Miss Angela and choir? Yeah, I know y'all do. So anyway, and I know that y'all, y'all get to put up with me this morning. So anyway, uh, on this Wednesday night, it is our family night uh, supper. Time for that again. And so we look forward to that. I invite everyone to come and partake of that on uh, 6 o'clock on Wednesday night. And also, uh, Sheila and I are going to be having an anniversary, and I know that there's other anniversaries that are going on, but uh, she's had to put up with me for almost 44 years. I told her if she'll behave, we'll make it through the 12th of 44 years. What was that? (laughs) Her, Her heart has been blessed. Okay, so she is. She she is tough, and she's made it through, uh, following me around the world, it seems like. But anyway, you are so sweet, darling, and you get sweeter all the time. Okay, especially the way they feed you all these sweets at the church and everywhere. But anyway, uh, so next Sunday, we're not going to be here. And so y'all don't stay home, but come back uh, Brother Freddie Smith is going to come and, and preach for us, and you'll enjoy him. He's, he's uh, been a minister for many years, and I know that he is uh, uh, able to handle that. So you just come and support him on next Sunday as Brother Freddie comes to, to preach for us. But we are going to enjoy this day, and then uh, Wednesday uh, we'll have our fellowship time and just uh, enjoy the, the things that God allows to be in our path. And uh, just praise God for his goodness and mercy today. Let's go to the Lord in a word of prayer. 
Father, thank you, Lord, that you have given us the opportunity to be here today. And Lord, we praise your name for the beauty of this day. It is a beautiful day, God. And Lord, I didn't see any clouds inside. I'm kind of glad that there's not any rain today. Uh, but we thank you for the beauty of this day. The, the heavens declare your glory, even if there's a cloud, the sun, the moon, the stars, whatever it is, it, it declares your glory because God saying that you are their creator. Uh, Lord, when they do as they've been created to do. And God, may we be the same way. way. May we declare your glory today. I thank you, Father, that you watch over us and you guide us along the journey of life. I thank you for this nation, being able to live in this nation. God, it's in a mess in a lot of ways, but God, it's still the best place to live in this world. Thank you for those who give of their time, their talents, and their service, God, to help this nation to, to stay safe, God, and to do things, God, that are behind the scenes, that we can enjoy the liberties that we have, God. Thank you for all that they do. Thank you, God, for all that you do continuously to guide and to care for each and every one of your children at all stations in life. And so, Father, I pray as we come together today that you'd be honored and glorified from the hearts of every individual here as we look toward you and praise your name because as as we sang earlier, God, you are holy, God. You're perfect in all your ways. and You're not going to change from that. So, God, may we just enjoy the blessings of being in your presence today. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Our next hymn this morning is hymn number four, To God Be the Glory. morning is our offertory hymn, hymn 550, I'd Rather Have Jesus. Please stand and join in singing. Thank you. 
be seated as the ushers come forward and the choir steps down. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we're so thankful to be here this morning, Lord. We're thankful for this opportunity to give back, even if it's just such a small amount, dear Lord. Uh, just can't compare with the, the sacrifice that was made for us on the cross, dear Lord. We just thank you so much for all the many blessings, dear Lord. We just ask that you watch over us and keep us safe and forgive us our sins, dear Lord. We pray over these tithes and offerings that they'll be used to honor and glorify you. Heavenly Father, we pray. Amen. Amen.
Sister Andrew, you sounded better than when I was working with you earlier, practicing with you. <laughs> Y'all know that's not the truth. Yeah. Appreciate Sister Andrew and, and Sister Heather and the ministry that God's given them here. And love them as sisters in Christ, whether y'all like it or not. Acts chapter 1, verses 1 through 11. Acts 1, verses 1 through 11. We have preached uh, about the triumphal entry of the Lord Jesus Christ. We have preached about his death, burial, and resurrection. And so it would just seem that we need to pick up this morning on what happens uh, after he had risen from the borrowed tomb on the third day and some of those things that had taken place there. Uh, when you read in Acts chapter 1 verses 11, he kind of gives us insight on that and so it's uh, something needful for us to be looking at today. In Acts chapter 1, <clears throat> verses 1 through 11. The former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach until the day in which he was taken up after he, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments to the apostles whom he had cho chosen, <clears throat> to whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs being seen by them during 40 days and speaking of things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he has said, you have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, It is not for you to know the times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And when he had spoken these things while they watched, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. Let's pray. Once again, Father, we come to you with praises and thanksgiving, God. Lord, for the privilege of worshiping you together as the assembly, the called out ones, called out, God, from the darkness of this world to the light of the glorious gospel of Christ where you have commanded us that we should not forsake that assembly, but yet we should eagerly look forward to that assembly where we together, Lord, have something great in common among us and that continues to get sweeter and greater every day, and that is that we have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. God, you have adopted us into your family. You have given grace to us for salvation. You've given grace to us to sustain us in life. You are one day going to glorify us and take us all into your kingdom, Lord, in a place called heaven that is a void of any kind of sin or wrongdoing. And so therefore it ought to be, God, that we come together with rejoicing. It ought to be that we come together with praises in our hearts. It ought to be, God, that you would be the focus of our attention as we separate ourselves from this world, God, and the things that are going on in life to give you our devotion, our loyalty, and our love today. As we have read this word, I pray, God, that you would impart spiritual truth to us as we would receive it in accordance to your divine and holy will, and we will honor you and glorify you with that. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. 
Now, as you start off in the book of Acts, where he says, the former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach, we also know that at the latter part of Luke, in the last few verses, as a matter of fact, he's, I'll read this in Luke uh, 24, verses 50, says, And he led them out as far as Bethany, and he lifted up his hands and blessed them. And it came to pass while he blessed them that he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple praising and blessing God. Amen. Now, the reason he starts off like that in Acts chapter 1 is because he is also the same writer. The physician Luke, the apostle, wrote the book of Luke, and he also wrote the book of Acts. And he's just picking up where he had left off with just a brief description of what had, had taken place at the end of that gospel, and he's delving into it a little bit further because it's important that we understand not only the triumphal entry, not only the suffering of Christ, not only the resurrection of Christ, but also the purpose uh, that is behind his ascension. What and all did that accomplish for those apostles that day and believers that day as well as for us today? And you know what I know about God? That all-powerful God has always been all-powerful and he always will. And that I know that God's word is a powerful word of God that moves men and women and draws them into himself through the person and power of the Holy Spirit. God's word is power. And so God wants us to understand what is going on through the power of his word as we gain understanding about what we're supposed to be about as a child of God. It's important that we would understand the message that he is laying out for us. And when he says that, you know, uh, the things that Jesus began to do. Well, what did he begin to do and teach as we go through the Gospel of Luke or the other Gospels for that matter or any of the epistles? It's a wide description of many things that he came for. We have to go back and recount, okay, the things that Jesus began to do. What is the first thing that he began to do? The first thing that he began to do was showing compassion and mercy and grace that he was willing to leave heaven him down for you and I, right? Can't we use that as a starting place of things he began to do and to teach for us? Now, we could go all the way back to Genesis, but we don't have time for that. So we're going to pick up in the gospel and the new covenant and then the dispensation of grace where he's showing us something new. And he came not to serve himself, he said, but to, you know, not, but to, you know, to serve us, not to serve himself. He came to serve us as a servant of all the people. And so anyway, he came to express to us his compassion and his love. And he's establishing up front that, you know, the whole purpose behind this gospel, the whole purpose of his coming was because he chose to love us. He chose to love you. He chose to love me while we were yet sinners, living in sin, shaking our fist in the face of God. While we were other, on the other side of the tracks, so to speak when we had no heart for God or anything like that. So uh, the things that Jesus began to do was to show us that God is love. As a matter of fact, the familiar verse that we're all familiar with, for God so loved the world that he gave his own begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life, right? John three sixteen. And so God's establishing a biblical principle for you and I to have and to hold and to he's entrusted that to us and he wants us to embrace it. Because there will be many times in your life and in my life that as we encounter life at the good times, the bad times, or the tragic times, that what will hold us steady is the fact that we know that the God who came came because he loved us, right? God loves you. Let that sink into your heart and your mind and your soul. And you can wake up in the morning with no money in your pocket. You can wake up in the morning with no job. You can wake up in the morning with feeling bad and aching and hurting and painful. But you still have a reason to rejoice that God loved you enough too. Right? God loved you in such a manner, in such a way, that we are where we are today. Because of God's love. Because I can tell you, it's not because of my love for him. 
not because of my works for him. It's not because of my goodness for him. It was just all because God chose to. The things that he began to do. He began to show us his great love. Now, as we could, we could go on forever on that, uh, uh, that thought, but it, it, let's go on from there, the fact that God loves us. But he loved us so much that he wasn't willing to, uh, to leave us in the state in which we were in. Because we were, the scripture says in Ephesians, we were dead in our trespasses and sins, and there was no hope in us. We're talking about the spiritual things in life. So you can have hope to make a bunch of money and have a good retirement. That's not real hope. We're talking about spiritual hope. We're talking about the spiritual side of things where we know that all that we attain in this life means nothing if we don't have eternal life. Because there's none of us going to take any of this stuff with us what we're going to take with us is our works that we have done in the name of Christ that honor and glorify him and that we also get rewards or loss of rewards for. And so it's amazing to me when I think about the things that Jesus began to do and to teach. He began to show us his love. He began to, to show us not only that his love was so great, but that, that God loved us so much he didn't want to leave us where we was at. So he had a plan in place before he ever came, and that was he was going to be our deliverer. He was going to be the one who would get us out of the mess that we are in. And so as he came in the Gospels, and he came walking on the face of this earth, what is the first thing he started teaching? What's the first thing he started preaching? About the need for repentance of sin. See, Old Testament theology was there were on uh, Passover day, they were constantly, uh, you know, sacrificing in the temple lambs and they were sprinkling blood on the altar. The high priest would go in every year for the people and to do those things. And so there was always the indicator and the shadow of the fact that there must be the shedding of blood for sin. Without the shedding of blood, sin remains. Even at the Passover when he's delivering Israel, he said, now, when I'm coming, the, sin, the death angel's coming through, and you're in the Egyptian body, if you will put those, the blood on the door lintels, the frame of the door, the death angel will pass over you, not hurt you in any kind of way. Now, he's foreshadowing, once again, that there must be the blood covering for the deliverance from the judgment to come. We know that many of the Egyptians, the firstborn, was, was taken away from them, not just of people, but of Animals and beasts also, it said. And that there was a great crying and wailing of the sorrow and of the loss that they experienced. But all of God's people that had shed, put that blood over the door until he passed through and their firstborn was not killed. They were passed over. And so what he did when he came to the New Testament, trying to help them to understand, okay, it's Passover time. Yes, I'm the Passover lamb, and I've been preaching that, teaching that, telling you these things since Genesis right on through. But I want you to understand, I'm the Passover lamb, and I came because you need forgiveness for sin. You need to be reconciled to God. The only way that's going to happen is if I go to the cross and die for you and shed my blood on the cross for you, that's the only way that you're going to have deliverance from being a sinner. A sinner is one who is positionally placed in darkness. They do not know God. There is no spiritual light. There is no righteousness. There are no good words. There's nothing good from a spiritual perspective. As a matter of fact, he says it this way, that we are bankrupt when it comes to spiritual things if you're a sinner. And so he knew that that's where we were at. And he said, now, the way to, to, to get out of that position of hopelessness and death and being enslaved to sin is that I'm going to go and give my life. I'm going to shed blood because there has to be the shedding of blood, not the blood of goats and bulls and rams. They ain't going to get it done. It's a foreshadowing. It's a type. But I, the Passover lamb, when I shed my blood, that's going to be sufficient to please God, the Father, for who you are if you receive what I'm doing on your behalf. And so it was through the shedding of blood that we know that we were able to attain the righteousness from Christ to be pleasing to the Father. Okay, So he says, the first thing, not only do I love you, but I want you to know that I love you enough to give my life, but I also expect something from you. 
I expect you to understand what's going on here, and I expect you to come to a place where you see that you are spiritually dead and that you need to repent of your sins. You need to ask Christ to save you and receive cleansing from that sin that places you as being a sinner where you are blinded to the truth. You've got to repent of sin. It is a mandatory statement. How shall they hear this message without a preacher? And, you know, he said, I'm going to proclaim this to you. I've been proclaiming through the prophets and the preachers that I'm calling after. But the message is that you need to repent of sins. Not turn over a new leaf. Not, not find a church to go to and start attending. Not, not just go through the baptismal pool. Not just get in a position of service and think that you've been reconciled unto God because none of that will do it. None of that will make you spiritually any better than you were when you were over here lost and undone and living in darkness. None of that helps. It's only when you truly genuinely understand the message that he has given. And see, here's the sad thing. It may seem simple to you, but I want you to understand there are millions and millions of people in hell today because they do not understand the message. How many of the religious folks understood the message in Jesus' day? How many Pharisees understood that message in Jesus' day, and you'll say, well, well, they just didn't accept him as Savior. Okay, good enough. They didn't understand the message. They didn't understand what was in need from them so that they could be righteous before God because they were placing it on works. They were placing it on positions. They were placing it on, on authority. They were placing it on, on how good they looked to other people and how they could rise above others and think them better than themselves than they really were. They didn't understand the message. Can I say to you today that there's still a lot of people that don't, don't understand the message. They don't understand the message that to be right before God and to receive forgiveness of sins, it's not any works or anything that you can do. It is nothing less, nothing more than us coming to a place to where we realize without Christ we will die and go to hell and we genuinely, sorrowfully repent of our sins and we cry out to our Savior to forgive us of our sins and we mean every word we're saying. As a matter of fact, it is the heart cry of the individual who understands the lostness of their plight and understands the judgment of God that you are just crying out before God for mercy. And you're crying out to God because all of a sudden when he gives you that understanding, you don't like the sinner that you are. And you don't like the sin that you've been involved in. It is horrible to you. It, it, it is something that's terrible that you don't want any part of. You recall away from it because you're seeing as God sees. Man, you can't get on your face before God. And yeah, you may shed tears or you may not, but in your heart you're weeping for those sins that you have committed against him and you want to turn away from that sin and you repent, you repent, you repent of those sins. You don't just join the church. You don't just take up a new leaf. You don't just do those things. No, you repent of sin. You turn away from a way of life that you are living and you turn to God. And in turn, God turns you inside out, right? He makes you a new creature in Christ. And when you wake up in the newness of life and you've been born of the Spirit of God because you've actually understood the message then it has transformed your life. And you do not get over it. You know, I, I've been in, in church my whole life, folks. I've been in the ministry and preaching the gospel for around 37, 38 years. I've served God way longer than that. Many of you have served way longer than I have. And it's sad to me that when we come into our church that many times that we can't get passionate and excited about what Christ not only has done but is doing. Now, I know that there's different personalities in every church. I understand that. But I think that sometimes that we think that we've learned so much and we've gotten dignified that we don't want to do those things because somebody may look at us in a wrong glance. 
And I'd say this, that in a lot of our churches, it's not people that are dignified, but rigor mortis has set in because they're dead and they've not been born of the Spirit of God and they need to get right with God. Amen or oh me. Man, life is about living for the Lord. It's not this other stuff. It's not this other stuff. I praise God for every good thing He's ever done in my life. I praise God for every, every opportunity that I've had. But what I know that the core of my being is of what he's got, God has done in, in and through my life. And I still can't get over the fact that he forgave me of my sins. And he still does. See, the message has got to be clear. And there's too many people missing the simplicity of the gospel and confusing the message and they're basing on other things the relationship that they have they think with the Lord so you got to understand what the message is in Ephesians chapter 1 uh, verses let me see Ephesians 1 is the Ephesians in my Bible anymore somebody done jerked it out okay the devil will, I can tell you that if you don't watch him. He'll try to jerk it away from you. In Ephesians chapter 1, verses, well, I start at verse 15. It says, Therefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and your love for all the saints, Paul talking to the brethren in Ephesus, do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, unveiling himself to you and I with the nakedness of spiritual understanding that we can't look toward heaven or toward him without rejoicing and praises in our heart. And folks, the understanding and the unveiling does not come from you and I having an intellect that can grasp us. It's you and I having the abilities and the understanding because of repentance of sin, relationship with him, that we humble ourselves before him and we cry out to him to understand him more to see him more clearly and we enjoy what he's got to give us it's those spiritual things in life that we desire more than food itself more than the breath of life itself it's to bathe into the rivers of waters of living life that God has given us gaining understanding the eyes of your understanding being enlightened that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints and what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his mighty power. My goodness, my goodness, God, show me more, give me more. I want more because you can't get enough of what God has in store for you. And it's an everyday search, it's an everyday opportunity, it's an everyday feast where we are identified as a child of God, not just by calling ourselves a Christian, but by the way that we live and that we want to ingest the Word of God, we want to be filled with the Spirit of God, and we want to live it out according to His will in our lives. And our stability relies not in this world, the way that it's going, whether things are good or bad. It relies in the fact that God has given us the opportunity to know him and to be blessed by him every waking moment of every day. God help his people to understand that we're not here just to come and to just sit and to act like there's nothing that's good or great in life, but we're coming together as the family of God with a understanding of the message and the enlightenment that he's given in our lives and we rejoice with one another for his goodness grace upon our lives and his works in and through our lives amen god has blessed you god has blessed me and you know what i know about this god that i know he's going to keep on giving that to us and i'm going to keep on undeservingly be thankful for it Give us understanding, Lord, of the truth of your word, that we may know how to operate as a child of God, that we may know how to operate as a church of the living Lord Jesus Christ, that we operate on the basis of the leadership of the Holy Spirit and based upon the power of God and the manifestation that God would give us day in and day out. 
And it springs from a heart of worship unto him. Man, they had a, a message that long as we are living, we are to do what Christ has done. Physically, he ascended, but he left you and I, individuals, that he is saved by his precious blood, which is called to and referred to not only as a household of faith, but the church that we are to be the visible manifestation of the bodily Christ who was here to do what he did while he was here. We understand richly. In other words, be filled with the Spirit of God, with knowledge of the Word of God, what its teachings are, and that we, as best as we can, motivated by the power of God and looking for the glory of God, that we're living according to His Word. If we do that, not only is the doctrine important, but I'll tell you what else comes into play, and that is holiness that is mandatory. Are you going to believe anything I say? If I tell you about the goodness of God and my trust in Him, my love for Him, and I'm going out here and doing everything contrary to that? No, you're not going to believe me. And you shouldn't. The Christian life ought to be backed by holy living. Because we're taking it to heart. We understand the importance of staying separate from the world. We understand the importance of following him no matter what is going on in our lives that we're seeking to be holy. As the first Peter would say, be ye holy as I am holy. We know that God is holy and we're to be holy like him. We separate from things of the world with our mouth, with our thought, with our actions because that's not what God wants. And we walk according to his word, what God's calling in is in our lives. And so we understand the importance of the message to be lived out. How dare me to go out and try to evangelize someone if I'm not living what I'm saying to them. How dare me to go into someone's home and say, well, would you trust Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord of your life? And I know that life is hard, and I know you don't have finances. I know your loved one's dying. I know this sickness is going on, but God can, and God does minister to those. It cast all your cares upon him because he cares for you. And if I don't really live that out of my life, I'm nothing more or less than a hypocrite myself. And so we're to live holy before God. And, and that's the message he's given. These apostles are laying the foundation of the church. And the church is going to be built upon the authoritative word of God. And if a church moves off of that word, and there are many that are moving away from the word of God, they're taking a pen knife and cutting out and believing what they want to, and the rest of it that they don't like, they take it out. And then they start building their church based upon what they think the Word of God ought to say or should have said and something that they can agree with, though they don't agree with the Word as a whole. And therefore, they're starting to build on a false foundation that's going to crumble. Don't you do your life like that. Don't you fabricate an image of God that's not real. Don't you base your spiritual life on your feelings and on your experiences. All of us got feelings. All of us got experiences. It's based upon the truth of God's Word. Don't matter what you think. Doesn't matter our experience. What matters is, is it God's Word? And are we going by that? So he had to establish that very clearly. These things that Jesus began to do and to teach, I want you to keep on doing it. The message needs to be delivered. And then he goes on down to say, and I know we're not getting very fast very far, but we may have to just come back to this. To whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs being seen by them during 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Now, now here's what he's referring to. Uh, Jesus has done what he came to do. We know that they always thought that he should have been the king that overthrew, overthrew the Roman Empire. And it sure did mess a lot of people up. A lot of his followers that when he was crucified and died on the cross, it just, it, it just threw them out of sync. This is not the king. If it had been the king, he would have he would have, he'd have overthrown through Rome, and we would have been established as as God's covenant people. We would have been established, and we would have ruled and reigned over them. 
And so it didn't, Jesus didn't fit their criteria. He didn't fit their understanding because they were thinking on feelings and facts that were not real. They were putting him in a box and saying, this is who I want him to be. And you don't put Jesus or God in a box at all. And so anyway, uh, even the apostles and the disciples themselves, you know, when he was crucified, they forsook him. They fled. They were scared to death. Now, I understand that it was a very volatile time in their lives that they knew because the, the Pharisees and the, uh, you know, the, San, uh, the, the Sadducees, the Sanhedrin, the, all of these uh, religious folks had come and they were going to do away with Jesus because of envy and, and, and just spite. And they knew that they were targets, and they knew that they could be killed too. And so they were fri- uh, uh, frightened. They were scared. They were scared not only for themselves, but their families. And so they were, they were not uh, <laughs> the right frame of mind to be able to take a message so valuable to disperse to a world because they were really not living it out at that time. They needed something, uh, some more. And, you know, after he resurrected, the scripture says that he spent 40 days showing himself to different ones. They needed to know more than the truth that they had been taught. They needed to know more than what they were able to understand. They needed to understand deeper in a more effective way of who Christ was. They really struggled at the fact that he had died. And they were trying to come to grips with the fact, even though they had seen him and he looked like a ghost and scared them to death, that he was really alive. They were, they were really trying to get that in their, their minds and hearts. It was taking, uh, taking some more time. So the Lord, for 40 days, uh, came and appeared to them in a closed room that was locked doors. The doors were locked because they were in fear. He came and appeared to Cephas. He came, and the scripture said, Paul said, hey, he even came to show himself to me, and that's the Damascus Road experience, one who was born out of due time, but Christ showed himself to the apostle, or to Saul of Tarsus on the road to Damascus in Acts chapter 9. He said, I was born out of due time, but he showed himself to me also that he was alive. You remember Peter, the one who denied him, that he took and he went to him while they were fishing, and he, and he had some, some, some me time with the apostle Peter and said, listen, I want you to understand that I love you. You denied me, but we've got to move on from that. And, uh, you know, he ate fish with him. He ate some honeycomb and all that. Anyway, he said, you know, go out and do what I've called you to do. Do you love me or do you love that? latter part of John chapter 19 and following, or John chapter 20. And so he's having to reinforce the teachings. And in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses uh, 5, 7, and 8, somewhere along in there, that he showed himself, uh, you know, to over 500 Different people, people that are not named. What is he doing? He's already, res- why is he hanging around here for 40 more days? Because he is trying to establish the fact that in their minds and their hearts that they are serving a living Lord Jesus Christ. He's alive, he's alive, he's alive. It's easy to say that. It's much easier for us to say today, well, I know he's alive than it is to really understand it and to live by it. Because we're great at drawing near to him with our lips when our hearts are far from him. Jesus is alive. Jesus is with us today. Jesus will be with us tomorrow. He is the indwelling of the Spirit of God that He dwells in us. He will never leave us nor forsake us. It is coming to a place and an understanding that we believe with all our being that He's alive. When I go home and my wife go home to our home, He's there with us. He's alive and he's well and he's ruling and he's reigning. No matter how crazy of an administration and legislation that we got today, he is ruling over all. Why? Because he's alive. He's alive. He's a living Lord Jesus Christ. Psalms 103.19 says, The Lord has established his throne in heaven and his kingdom rules over 
all. One of the oldest books in the Old Testament, Job would say this. Verses uh, chapter 19, Job 19 verses 25. For I know that my Redeemer lives. This is before Christ has ever, ever come to the face of the earth. And he shall stand at last on the earth. And after my skin is destroyed, this I know. After I am dead, this I know. That in my flesh I shall see God. Even Job came to the place with all the suffering that he had been through, the loss of ten children, the loss of his wealth, the loss of his position, the loss of everything, but now he is saying, I know my Redeemer lives, and even though I should die, I know I will see him one day again. He believed with all of his heart that Jesus is alive. Folks, I'm telling you, I think that the church has got to get back on track and believe that our Lord is alive and well and that because he lived we li he lives we live and that I go in and out of my life because I know that he is living in me and I'm living for him and everything's going to be all right amen God help us to grab hold of doctrinal truth and a, a passion and a love for Christ that will not be, uh, you know, suffocated by the trials and the tests and the craziness of the world in which we live in. He says, I've got to show myself to these guys time and time again so that they'll know that I'm alive. And you know what? They got it. And when they got it, those 12 disciples turned the world upside down because they had a passion, they had a zeal, they had a reason that was uh, far surpassing anything they'd ever had before of living in this world. And it wasn't for this world, but it was for the world that God had created for them, for the spiritual life that God had given them. And man, they knew, they knew that he was alive and that they were headed to where he was at. All that I long for, all that I want in my life, everything that I would hope that I would be able to accomplish is in him. He's alive. He's worth living for. If I can't die to myself, I can't live for him. And I, I you know, I know we've got, we've got so much stuff that we have to to go by in this world. There's so much regulations. There's so much rules. There's so much stuff that is, is passed down upon us to live in this old world. But I'm telling you, if it comes to the place in your life where you have been suffocated to where you're not living with the joy of the Lord in your heart because he's real. And I stand with Job. Man, there's nothing great about me. Never has been, never will be. I'm not going to be a great influencer in this world. And I, may, I will never be rich in this world. All those things. But I also would say my Redeemer lives. And in my morning times, I shout out to Him. And I praise Him because I know He hears me. I know that my Redeemer lives as I stand to preach the Word of God. I know my Redeemer lives when I go out into the workplace. I know my Redeemer Redeemer lives every aspect of every day, and I want to live for him, and so I want you to also. He's alive. And we need to live in such a manner that people know that he's alive in us. He matters. Amen? Folks, God knows from the depths of my soul, if it wasn't for him, I would not be before you today. I would have done been gone and busted hell wide open. And I would have called myself having a good time. I would have called my life being one that I wanted to live, that I was enjoying. But because he lives now, I know I live. As we come to a time of invitation, it's not about having everything perfectly and in order. In your life, it's not about having everything perfectly in order as we go through the programs of the church. 
It's about learning how and knowing how to follow the leadership of the Holy Spirit, God in me, who is leading and guiding, and he does everything decently in order according to his word, not our thoughts. As we stand and sing, what page, Sister Heather? 275, I surrender all. You're here today and you need to be saved. Today's a good day to get saved. You're here today as a child of God and your wood won't burn because it's wet. Hey, get your wood dry. Get filled with the Spirit of God. Get right with God. Turn away from your sin and turn to God. Today's the day. Let's live for Him because He's alive. And let's show it to the world. As we sing. Let me feel thy holy spirit. 